Amen. I know. I'm surprised too. Uh, I got a text from the Reverend Dr. Grant Miller last night. Uh, he said, hey, I'm not feeling so well. I don't think I'm going to make it to work. It might be the snow in March thing. Got me down. Uh, I need you to speak in chapel tomorrow. And I said, uh, what? Okay, uh, sure. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I don't have like a fun question for you. I've got one page of notes. So buckle up because we're both in for a ride this morning. Okay? So we're going to start by uh, getting into the word this morning. Today's scripture is a continuation of what we talked about last week, starting in Romans 12. We're going to pick up today Romans 12, verse 9, ending in verse 21. Here's what the good book says. It says, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. And if you don't know, together we all give thanks by saying thanks be to God. So I'm going to say it again, and then we're all going to say thanks be to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And that's half of my notes. Done. So this is great. Uh, I know. The people in the back are really excited about that. Um, scanners be ready. Just kidding. Um, so this is the second half of Romans chapter 12. And this is one of those times where when we split up scripture by chapter and number, uh, chapter and verse, I don't know if you know this, but in the original text, uh, it's not like Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome and put a bunch of chapter numbers and chapter headings and verse numbers and was like, hey, uh, this Sunday you should read the first half of Romans 12 and next Sunday, trick shot, read the second half. No, it's just all one letter that would be read at one time. So it's really hard to understand what's going on here in Romans 12, 9 through 21 without understanding what the rest of Romans 12 says, which is one of my favorite verses, uh, passages of scripture in the whole Bible. And it starts like this, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your holy and pleasing act of worship to God. And it goes on to say, Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can see the will of God, the good and pleasing will. Something like that. You get it. Um, here's what I'm convinced if we could put uh, the beginning verse, Romans uh, 12, 9, that like first part on there. It says, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And a few verses ago, Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know the good will of God. Here's what I'm convinced. When Paul says, hold fast to what is good, when I would read this when I was like a high school student or a college student, I'd read this big list of commands and think like, oh, this is a checklist for Christian life. Like, I've got to do all of these things. I don't even know what zeal is, but I better not lag in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've got so much on my plate already. And it's, you know, midterms were just here. Like, there's so much stuff to do. And now I've got to contribute to the needs of the saints. Like, what? i got to bake bread or something? I don't know. Um, but what I'm convinced Paul is saying here is if you, instead of being conformed to the patterns of this world, are transformed by the renewing of your mind and offer your bodies as a living sacrifice before the Lord, this is the natural byproduct. So Paul is convinced that we need to do two things, offer our bodies and renew our minds, which is the transformation of the whole person. Now I know you don't work at NNU for most of the students in here, but there are faculty and staff in here, which does make this a lot more nerve-wracking for me. 
because those people I see in staff meeting all the time. And when I first started working here at NNU, here's a confession for you. I have two confessions this morning, two book reports, and a story. My first confession is I did not attend NNU for my undergraduate studies. I attended a much lamer, much less snowy school in San Diego, California, called Point Loma Nazarene University. Go see lions. Um, it used to be like a real lion of the sea. It's a whole thing. Anyway, I did not attend this institution. And when I started working here, one of the things that our great president, Joel Pearsall, told me in our first staff meeting is, uh, you have to memorize the mission statement. Luckily, I don't see Joel in here. I've got the first half really well memorized. I don't know. I've got it on my phone. I was worried I'd be nervous, so I'm just going to read it instead of, you all know that I memorized it, but I'm going to read it. <laughs> it's like when you memorize scripture, but we still read it from a page, just so you guys know, like, this is what it actually says. So this is the mission statement of NNU. The mission of Northwest Nazarene University is the transformation of the whole person centered in Jesus. The NNU education instills habits of heart, soul, mind, and strength to enable each student to become God's creative and redemptive agent in the world. Oh, that should just bring a tear to your eye right there. That's, we should say thanks be to God after that, you know. Uh, that's the mission statement of this institution. And here's the second confession that I have this morning on behalf of, if I'm so bold to do this, to speak on behalf of all the staff and faculty and administrative people in this room. Students, um, we kind of tricked you when you came to NNU, for most of you. Some of you, you kind of knew what you were getting into, but a lot of you probably we tricked you because colleges in general have been conformed to a certain pattern where what you think you're receiving from us is that we are giving you instruction, maybe giving you wise counsel, maybe giving you unwise counsel sometimes, giving you some something that you're hoping is going to form you into something. You're taking a bunch of classes so that you can become an accountant or an engineer or a nurse or a social worker. Or if you're like me, you're a music major and you don't know what that means. You're just like, I couldn't do math. I can't really paint. I'll do something else. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you think that the mission of NNU is to sit in a bunch of classes, turn in a bunch of assignments, get a piece of paper at the end, and be formed into something. An accountant, a social worker, an engineer, a nurse, a teacher, uh, a business administrator, whatever that means. And hopefully, maybe we sprinkle a little bit of Christ on there, right? Like we take some general elective Bible classes, maybe you bought a Bible for the first time at the bookstore, like it's great, you leave here, you've become something, and maybe Jesus has something to do with that. Here's how we tricked you. Every single staff and faculty member in this room does not care about the something you become. Not one of us. We do not care what your major is. If you're in my cornerstone class, we do not care when you turn your homework in, as long as it's before grades are due, because our registrar does care. Um, we don't care what the something you become is. We don't. We don't care. The transformation that NNU seeks is the transformation of the whole person, not into something, but into the image of someone. We don't care about the something that you become. We care that as you sit in those classes, you take those tests, you scan into chapel, you play on your phone in the back of chapel, whatever it is, that slowly, through instilling habits of heart, soul, mind, and strength, you would learn to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice and renew your mind so that you might be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? That's my second confession this morning. I told you I got two book reports to give. They're both on books that I didn't really like. The first one, which this is kind of controversial, but I also read it when I was 19 and really dumb, uh, was Dark Night of the Soul by St. John of the Cross. I really didn't like that book. It was one of those things, some of you might be like me, where you want to appear intelligent without having to do the work of intelligence. So there's a great resource for that. Uh, it's the free book cart in the library. You just take as many free books as you want, you put them in your dorm room, you bring some people over and they're like, oh my goodness, you've read so many things. These aren't even required materials for class. 
This is amazing. So I was grabbing books from the Point Loma Library. I used to do this like once a week. I had so many books that I never read. But luckily, Dark Knight of the Soul is really short. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll read this one. And St. John of the Cross writes this book, Dark Knight of the Soul. It's about a lot of things, but what it, it mostly is about is that you as a Christian come to a crisis point where you realize you have to empty yourself and take on the full mantle of Christ. And he has some really intense language about kind of like self-denial and all these types of things. And I grew up as like a real youth group kid. Uh, I went to like all those conferences where they're like, this is the generation that's going to change the world for Christ. And then like the next year at the next conference, they say, no, this is the generation that's going to change the world for Christ. I've never been to a conference where they're like, this generation could just sit on the sidelines. Like, we'll wait until the next one. It'll be fine. And so I grew up with this idea that like, you know, that, that, I'm going to be a little edgy here. That like idea that like your calling is where your greatest passion meets the world's greatest need. And like only you have the gifts and abilities that you have. And God made you really special so that you can fulfill this role for his kingdom. And St. John of the Cross is kind of like, nah. <laughs> the whole point of this Christianity thing is not to become something for God. But it is to become as Christ for the world. And I was like, man, that's stupid, bro. <laughs> like, what am I taking all these music theory classes for if I'm not trying to become something? Like, Jesus didn't do music theory. Jesus never got married. That's lame. That's crazy. I'm not trying to do that. But as I've, as I've grown, slightly matured, my prefrontal cortex grew a little bit after 19, uh, I realize there's a lot of truth in that. That like the NNU mission statement, the whole goal of this Christian thing is not to form you into something. It's to form you into someone. It is to deny yourself and to take on the mantle of Christ. Paul might write it like this. I, to crucify yourself with Christ so that you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. Which... I don't know if you guys are like into the Enneagram. I know that's like a millennial thing. And I know a lot of like kids are like, that's old. It's like I had to switch from skinny jeans to straight leg jeans because you guys are like, you look old, which was, that hurt. Thanks, Andy. Uh, that hurt. But on the Enneagram, I'm number three, which is the like performer and all those kinds of things. So for someone to be like, hey, your identity doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that you take on the mantle of someone else. I'm like, no way, dude. No, thanks. I didn't wear a tie today because I didn't want to be Grant. I didn't put my hair in braids. I didn't want to be Ashley. You know what I'm saying? You guys laughed a little too hard at that. Just kidding. <laughs> but the whole goal of this Christian thing, St. John of the Cross would say, is to like literally deny yourself and become Christ for the world. Like that's the whole point. Christ likeness is not a cool metaphor, but we are called to be like as Christ to the world. You're not called to be like the Christian Albert or the Christian Kip or the Christian Keziah for the world or the Christian Emma or the Christian Lincoln or the Christian Dr. Alvarez for the world. The something, all those boxes that you think you're called to, it's just not true. What Christ wants for the church is for us to be formed into the body and blood of Christ for the world. There's this really like fun word. I'm going to teach you uh, two fun words today. The first one's in English. The second one's going to be in Hebrew. Uh, the English word is really fun. It's called transubstantiation. It's going to make some people in this room really nervous. Uh, a lot of evangelical people are not really down with transubstantiation. It's this idea when you take communion that like the bread and the grape juice for us uh, become like the actual body and blood of Christ as you consume them. Uh, you can believe whatever you want about that. Uh, the kind of transubstantiation that I think is cool is there's this whole line of transubstantiation that believes like as you take communion, you are being formed into the thing that you are eating. You are becoming for the world the broken body and shed blood of Christ, which is weird. There's this other guy. This is the second book report. Uh, it's a book written by this French guy. His name's Rene Girard. Again, making people in here nervous. Um, it wasn't a fun read, I'll be honest with you. It's called Scapegoat. It's like mid. Uh, but Rene Girard, he writes about scapegoatism. It's a whole thing. You can read it if you want. I wouldn't recommend it. But there's one chapter that's really cool. 
where he basically says, have you ever thought about why Christ, when he resurrects, still has all his wounds? And as a seminary student, I was like, honestly, no, Renee, I've never thought about that. I guess you French people are on something different, you know? Uh, he's like, have you ever thought about why Christ resurrects with his wounds? Because when we think about the resurrection that Christ has kind of ushered us into, we're all like, oh, everything's going to be perfect in heaven. Like, I'm going to have a six-pack up there. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. I'm going to eat as many Thin Mints as I want. It's going to be awesome. Uh, don't have to worry about anything. But Christ comes back with, like, holes in his hands, holes in his feet, and a big hole in his side. And there's, like, a whole thing in the Bible. I don't know if you know about this guy, Th Thomas, who's like, I'm not going to believe until I put my fingers in the holes in his side, which is super gross. Um, and he does, which is also super gross. Uh, but Christ is resurrected with his bodily wounds, with the marks of the cross, which is like not how we think of heaven normally. And Rene Girard posits this, that think of it like a courtroom drama where in the jury are all the people who have been kind of oppressed, scapegoated, as the title of this book would say, um, by kind of the principalities and powers of the world. And the person on trial kind of represents all of the principalities and powers of the world and the prosecuting attorney gets up and calls the first witness to the stand. And the first witness is Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, who comes in with holes in his hands, holes in his feet, and a hole in his side. And as Christ, resurrected, perfected, with his wounds, sits in kind of the witness stand and gives his testimony, he does two things at once. He is empathizing. He finds solace with those who have been oppressed, but he also holds to account the principalities and powers who put him on the cross. It's this beautiful thing. It's like the only chapter of that book that you should read, I promise. Um, but it's this really cool idea that as we are formed into the body of Christ, we are formed into a body that has some wounds in it. And those wounds are helpful for the world because we're able to witness. There's this whole part in the, the verse we just read about um, like not repaying evil with evil, but overcoming evil with good because it heaps burning coals on the heads of those who have harassed you and all this stuff. That's what I think Paul is getting at, is this notion that, that as we embody Christ in the world, as we live as Christ in the world, we both empathize and recognize the ways that people and places and things have been misu misused and oppressed, and we hold to account the oppressive forces in the world. So that's my confession, my two book reports, and then I have another word to teach you real quick, which is this Hebrew word, which is really fun. It's Hanani. Can we put it up on the screen? Hanani. It's this Hebrew word, Hanani. Everybody say Hanani. Say it like you mean it, though, like Hanani, because that's what it is. It's a word that's supposed to be exclaimed. Uh, my Hebrew professor, when I was in college, always said it in like a really weird, like little kid's voice. He'd be like, Hanani, which was super annoying. Um, but it's this word, which is here I am. So every time, for the most part, somebody gets called to something in the Old Testament, this is the word that they're using, okay? So like Moses, the burning bush, calls out and is like, where are you? And he says, Hanani, here I am. God calls Abraham. Abraham says, Hanani, here I am. God calls Samuel, you know, he like whispers to him, and then Samuel thinks it's like an old dude in the temple, and the old dude's like, no, I'm sleeping, leave me alone. And then finally, uh, God calls him a third time. He says, Hanani, here I am. It's a really fun word. You can impress all your friends with it. Hanani is this word, which is the making yourself available to the thing that has called you. It's not just like, a, oh, I'm over here, but it's like, here I am, Lord. Send me is the classic text that we all know, um, or most of us know, or some of us, at least I know it. Um, and so here's what I think we are actually called to. If we're willing to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice and transform ourselves by the renewing of our minds, and if it doesn't matter the something that you're being formed into all that much, it really matters the someone that you're being formed into, this is the natural response that we should all take up, this word Hanani, which just means here I am. I'll be honest with you, I was a music ministry major in college, and then I got really into preaching for a while, which is a dangerous hobby. <laughs> and so I took a youth ministry job out of college, and I thought, man, this is what my life is going to be. 
Um, I'm going to do the classic Nazarene, like spend a couple years in youth ministry, then maybe go like be an executive, like teaching pastor or something, and then slide into that senior pastor role, and then eventually, you know, Nepo baby it all the way up to general superintendent. Like it's just going to be <laughs> sick. Um, a lot of Nepo babies in here. Uh, don't, let them, don't let them fool you. Um, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in there. Uh, but here's what I think we're actually called to. When God calls you to something, I'm not convinced that he's calling you to be something. He's calling you to be as Christ for the world, and whatever he calls you to, here's the response I think God expects from us, is this response, Hanani. And there's only one person in my life that I, like, personally know who has overwhelmingly embodied this really funny Hebrew word, and that person is my mom. And I have a picture of my mom. That's me and my mom. It's really cute. I had more embarrassing pictures, but... I was worried my mom would show up and then she'd be mad. She didn't, so I should have put those more embarrassing pictures on there, but she'll probably still watch it. So anyway, that's my mom. My mom's name is Debbie. Uh, She grew up in a broken home in Southern California in the 70s, so there's a lot to go through there. Uh, Wasn't a Christian until much later in life. Um, Ended up kind of being saved at a church that my grandfather was pastoring. My dad was like, who's that cute new single in the singles Bible study? They dated for like six months or something and they got married. It's crazy. It's kind of weird, honestly. But my mom is like the most Christian person I know and not in like a Hobby Lobby Christian way. I mean, she does have a lot of signs with like words at her house that are like live, laugh, love. She does have a lot of those. But she like embodies Hanani more than anyone else I know. And here's the one story I have about my mom that I think illustrates this um, kind of whatever comes your way, God's expecting you to say, here I am. So I grew up in Southern California, um, and there's a lot of like private schools are a big deal in Southern California. Um, Anytime that you can say like inner city in quotes, um, a lot of Christian people are going to be like, we should set up private schools. So I went to private school in California. Um, Thank you for the laughs over there. I heard them. Uh, I went to private school. Uh, it was in kind of a rougher neighborhood in Pasadena. We had these big, like, chain link fences all the way around our campus. And uh, for any of you who are parents or were kids at one point, uh, the pickup line at school is kind of a hot mess. You know what I'm saying? Uh, especially when the parking lot for your school is about as big as this platform right here. Uh, so we had cars, like, lined up down the street, you know, and it's kind of like a, a Hunger Games version of, like, who can pick their kids up the fastest. Um, and so my mom was stuck in our minivan uh, outside of Pasadena Christian School, waiting to pick me and my siblings up from school. And across the street from PCS was this place called Garfield Care Center, um, which was a retirement home um, for really low-income people. So basically what Garfield Care Center would do, and there's lots of places like this around the world, uh, they would take people's social security and in exchange, give them a like, really small bedroom to sleep in, feed them twice a day, and give them like $5 for cigarettes once a month. And so that's across the street. Uh, a lot of these people have like memory care problems, those kinds of things. Um, it's very underfunded. There's not a lot of great health care. Um, but they also have this like big truck that sells cigarettes outside of the care center. And so uh, there's a guy that my mom sees. Uh, she's in her car. She sees this guy buying cigarettes from the truck, and then he starts knocking on people's windows in the pickup line, which is like the worst case scenario because you're stuck, right? Like there's nowhere for them to go. They have to pick up their children. They can't just like peel out and drive away before he knocks. They're also like in line. They got to wait. This dude also has like blood all over his face. So there's layers to the story, okay? Uh, Kind of picture an older man, a little raggedy, blood on his face, a uh, box of cigarettes in one hand, knocking on people's windows, and kind of like mumbling to them. And most of the moms in this pickup line are like not rolling down their windows. Uh, they're locking their doors. They're doing that thing where you can like hear the like click. Um, kind of offensive, but whatever. Uh, it is passing in Christian school, but that's fine. Um, but then this guy gets to my mom's car. And my mom is the sweetest lady in the world. She'll befriend anyone. Uh, even like people with blood on their faces that she probably shouldn't roll her window down. Uh, She has my little sister in the car who's a student here. She was a child at the time in like a little car seat. My mom rolls the window down to this strange man with blood all over his face and is like, hey, what's going on? And he's like, can I have some money? And she goes, well, I I don't actually have any cash on me. Is there anything else that you want? And he's like, honestly, I would love a Diet Coke. And if you know moms of millennials, 
they love Diet Coke. And so she's like, you know what, I feel you. I actually have a McDonald's large Diet Coke extra ice in the cup holder. I haven't taken a sip yet, which is great restraint of a millennial mom. Uh, and she's like, here, you can have my McDonald's Diet Coke. And hands Kenneth this Diet Coke. And he thanks her, walks back to the care center, and she doesn't see him again. And then about a week later, she's driving uh, through pickup line again. And she's, again, uh, left some Diet Cokes in her car, kind of waiting for this guy to show back up. That's just my mom's whole vibe. Uh, so Kenneth comes back out, not blood on his face this time, and my mom's like, Kenneth, I have Diet Cokes for you. And not only does she have a Diet Coke, she pulls a 12-pack out of the back of her car and hands it to him. And he's like, this is amazing, thank you so much. She kind of develops this relationship with Kenneth. She starts dropping off 12 packs of Diet Coke for him. And one day she's dropping off this 12-pack. Some other people who are kind of smoking cigarettes outside of the care center are like, hey, lady, you know, we'd all like something nice. And I'm like, you get yours. Yeah, come on, demand something of this rich white lady. Uh, he's like, hey, we'd all like something nice. And my mom goes, well, what, what would be fun? He's like, you know, this one guy in a wheelchair is like, you know, we've, we haven't celebrated Christmas here since I've been here. And I've been here over a decade. And every year on Christmas, they give us an egg salad sandwich and put us to bed early. Could you throw a Christmas party for us? And my mom's like, I love Diet Coke and I love Christmas. This is my mission. Yes, I will throw a Christmas party for you. So I have some pictures that we could just kind of scroll through really fast. This is my mom with one of the patients at Garfield Care Center. Uh, she thought she was a Hollywood actress, like currently in this photo. Uh, she had shaved all of her like eyebrows off and had redrawn them with Sharpies on, which is like commitment um, for sure. There's some more pictures. Uh, some, this is me looking a lot younger. We're serving food, uh, all this stuff. My mom grabbed all of her friends from church one of which owned a restaurant. And so instead of egg salad sandwiches for Christmas, uh, these people were served prime rib and like green bean casserole, mashed potatoes, everything. Uh, we had to cut their prime rib for them because the staff wouldn't let the people have plastic knives. Um, There's a, a lot to learn. But every year growing up, we lived in Pasadena for like 10 years. So for a decade, every Christmas, before we went to church on Christmas Eve, we would go to Garfield Care Center and my mom would throw a Christmas party. We've got some other pictures. Uh, that's us singing carols. Um, you can kind of see the vibe. A lot of Christmas hats. And then there's another picture, I think. Each person at Garfield, with the help of my mom and, like, some of her Bible study friends, would get a care bag filled with, like, all kinds of things. None of them were essentials. It was, like, Starburst, Skittles, $10 for cigarettes, Diet Coke, all those things. And we did this for a decade, and it's still going on today. And it's all because my mom, truly like the most Christian person I know, saw a dude with blood on his face knocking on windows, who showed up and said, here's what I need. And my mom was like, honestly, I've needed Diet Coke a lot too. Here's a Diet Coke. When God presented himself to my mom as this guy, Kenneth, she responded with this simple Hebrew phrase. It would have been really cool if she actually said the Hebrew phrase, but she didn't. She don't know that. But she said, Hanani, here I am. Because my mom, more than anyone I know, has offered her entire self, her body, her mind, her heart, her soul, her strength, her wallet, her career, her aspirations, her dreams, her hopes, her failures. She's offered all of it to God and asked that the only thing that she would receive in return is to become more like the person that she is convinced is her Lord and Savior, which is Jesus Christ. And that's my challenge for you guys this morning, is that you would not be caught up in the some things that you think this institution is trying to shape you into, but you would fall in love with the someone and in that loving relationship become more and more like our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning 
for a place like in and you which values this transformation above all. And God, as we go out into our everyday normal lives, filled with Diet Cokes and Dex meals and tests and quizzes and annoying faculty meetings and all kinds of things, would you be ever present with us? And God, my prayer this morning is that you would present us with moments where we might respond with, here I am. You would present us with moments in which we might be for the world the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is the only thing that can bring about resurrection, renewal, and restoration. Be with us this week. Empower us, embolden us, and transform us into the image of the living God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace this morning.